So this is the last session for the intro class that we have been exploring the last three weeks. Um, so today being the last day, we'll just go ahead and do a quick recap of what was learned. We'll also talk about how we can take this practice home. We'll have a time for Q&A. And then we're going to learn a brand new meditation today that Mark would lead us. So just on week one, to remind everybody, seems like a long time ago. Um, first, week one, we talked about what's mindfulness, what's meditation, open awareness. all this interchangeable words, just defining it. Why do we want to meditate? The freedom that's available, not in the future or the past, just right here, just showing up for this life. And the practice on week one was mostly object oriented. It's centered in the body, in the senses, breathing, seeing, hearing, feeling the air. So everything that is very obvious, concrete, that we can follow through and easier to come back that would allow the mind to be anchored in one place. So that was week one. And then week two, we did talk about mental activity, everything that is, the sense input is interpreted in the mind, all mental activity that would include the quality of mind, the mood, attitude in the mind, the joy, the greed. <laughs> so we did also talk about thinking, how it's a little tricky to kind of catch thinking. We get so entangled with the content and then really believe that the content is real rather than recognize that it's just thinking no big deal just kind of wraps us up so even though feeling tones was part of um, it is part of mental activity we kind of covered that on week three so Maybe I'm forgetting, but um, so the meditation was also paying attention not only to the body, the thing, the the sense, the sense gates, but just paying attention to the quality of mind, to to the attitudes, what was happening in the present moment, what we were liking, what we don't like. And last week, we did cover mostly feeling tones. So once we are in every experience that, in all daily experience, whether we know it or not, each experience, each moment is tied to one of the three, whether the moment is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And most of the time, the tendency of the mind is to cling and try to prolong what's pleasant, try to avoid what's not pleasant, and for the most part, ignore what's neutral. We just don't remember, don't pay attention to it. 
So the meditation as well for feeling tones was mostly not only paying attention to the sense gates, to the thinking, whatever the mind is aware to, but just going a little deeper and trying to see if that was pleasant and pleasant or neutral. So, so that's gonna be useful even to take home. If we were only relating to experience as pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, and we don't really get so wrapped up in the story of what was happening, life would be much easier. And again, in week three, last week, we did cover the hindrances, which are the challenges to meditation and just, there were five obstacles to meditation. This included the first one being sense pleasure. As soon as um, we are able to sit down, then we feel cold or we feel hungry. We want to get up and do, can't wait till this is over. I want to have some ice cream when I go home, whatever the case might be. So just uh, we are so wrapped up in it. It has a big hold, this sense pleasure or sense gates. So that's the first one, wanting something, just wanting things, whatever it may be. And then its opposite is not wanting. I don't want this, can't wait till this passes. I want it to go away. So that's the other obstacle to meditation. We want something other than what is here. Or we want this so much. So wanting and not wanting. And then the next two are related to either low energy or high energy or anxious energy. We may be and as we sit down, feeling sleepy, kind of abducted somewhere else, or feeling restlessness and just wanting to move away. And the last one is doubt. Doubt is a little tricky sometimes. It is real and because it's because we are confused and we we just need more information. Sometimes it masquerades as wisdom. I've had enough doubt in my life. I know. I know it well. Still tricks me sometimes. Um, and we we talked not much, but we talked a little bit about the antidotes to this obstacles as well, whether opening our eyes doing a body scan, like if the mind is so agitated, trying to pay attention to open awareness may not work. So just step-by-step step doing a body scan, sometimes um, reflecting on impermanence, okay? things are passing. So this were mostly a recap of the last three weeks. So and today we're going to do a heart practice that is going to be really useful as well. It's generally referred to as metta. So we'll go over that later. So in terms of integrating practice to daily life, you may have just sprinkled throughout the last three weeks, but I just want to cover a few points. 
how do we take this home? How do we make it a habit in a way? How do we build a habit? How do we cultivate this? How do we not forget? Not necessarily what we learned, but just how do we incorporate this practice so that it would be helpful? Well, a few of the things that we, we talked about or we talk about at the beginning of every meditation is just to relax, really relax. Nothing is going to fall apart if we relax. But the habit is, oh my God, I got so many things to do and less tense up. So if you just trust relaxing. And I encourage all of you to check this out. Like caring stuff, it really doesn't help accomplishing anything. So relax, but stay alert. Relax does not mean sleep or don't care. How could I show up to this life in a relaxed way, but I also care? That's an exploration just to take, to think about. It's not easy <laughs> to relax when the, you know, what we have been practicing and cultivating has been not relaxing. Patience, we really have to be patient and to begin again when the mind is distracted, it's running away, bringing it back, just being kind. really hard to be kind even for oneself for the most part but relaxing helps and beginning again even if it's for the millionth time and kind of also trying to see to learn in every moment like when I relax and respond to my life in a relaxed way versus when I'm tense, what is the outcome? What happens? Like we really don't have to worry about what the Buddha said or Christ or somebody, but what is really happening here? Like if I'm so tense, I'm cursing. How does that feel in the body? Because the body does not lie. It's just here. We can follow, make this first weak lesson truly to just feel the body so coming back to the body remembering to be mindful in the way you don't remember that word it doesn't matter you can just come back to the body and breathe it really helps to have a friend to have a community because it's not easy not everybody is practicing or willing to it doesn't matter. Even if you have a pet, you can talk to them. I talk to my plants. I don't have any pets. In the morning, like, good morning, let's sit. They are really patient in sitting. So that's really helpful. And I don't know if you all live in town and if common ground is close by. If not, whether it's online or somewhere somewhere else, just building a community, even if you have one person that could sit with you, build this habit, it would be really helpful. Having a dedicated space in your home, even if it's in the office, during lunch or break, a walking path, something that you could remind yourself, these are a bell or meditation app, whatever helps. So just something that reminds you, oh, you know what? I just want to try this. I want I just want to sit for a minute. But for the most part, it's the interest, the intention. Some days, like I made it, it's just like before I fall asleep for one minute, I just want to, I just want to be mindful. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but you can make it before a meal, before making a phone call, make a pause, stop. Before going to the next thing, 
to see, be aware as best you can. It's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But the intention matters. Taking inventory of what we think matters. Our action, our speech matters. So it's not to be tense, but just to see like, when I respond this way, when I breathe this way, when I, when my intentions are this way, is that skillful or not? Every one of us could do that. And if it's not skillful, you could just drop that. I don't need to do they be involved in this and I could just drop it. So it's just remembering, trying to stay centered. When we get knocked off, to be patient, come back. Having a community, having a friend, creating a walking path, creating a sitting space, having a dedicated time as well really helps. And some people really sit for an hour at least, sometimes in the morning at night. Some people only have five minutes. But the idea is not to say like, I don't really have time. Like we really have to check out that. I don't have time story. It, it does not require any special block of time or room or anything. Like we can be aware that we are hearing at this moment, we are sitting at this moment. It is that simple. We just really love to make things complicated. And that has been really helpful for us. But still, just to come back, stay centered and say, I can just breathe. I don't have to do anything. Nothing is needed. Yeah. And in the Buddhist teachings, there is <laughs> this teachings are known as uh, the three marks of existence. We can remember that there is stress. And that stress is here in the heart. We can feel it. And we can see things are passing. Things are changing all the time. Summer seems to be disappearing and fall is going to be here so it's verifiable we could just check it out and then when we put down self-centered drama we are much lighter like the stress is a little bit less so just reflecting on those as well is really helpful yeah Mark. Okay. All right. Find a position. Let's practice a bit. Yeah. Let's just take a deep breath or two. And follow the breathing in all the way. And follow the breathing out. Could do this a few times. Just bring the awareness and the breathing. Mm. 
And then breathe in normally. As we breathe in, as we breathe in and out, we can recognize that hearing is being known, the temperature is being known in the body as well, the vent, you can hear the vent, you can hear my voice. Be aware of the body sitting, whatever is coming in the moment. We don't have to go look for objects, but just tuning in to what is present, what is being known. Remembering to relax, to put things down. We can check and see what the intention is or what the quality of mind is and whatever is being known. Is there some wanting or not wanting? Or just simple awareness, willingness to be here, not demanding anything from the moment. Just without doing anything, changing anything, we could just pay attention to what is here, to what is present in the mind. If there is thinking, we can just know it's thinking. The awareness itself knows what to do. There is really no doing required. You don't have to be confused what to pay attention to. Just whatever needs to be known really shows up. I just have to remember to bring the awareness 
and uh, stay connected and continue to be aware. And if we get pulled in, we can bring up the attention, the awareness back to the body, whether it's sitting or hearing. Any anchor would, will do. So in daily life, we may not have the luxury and there is so much movement, there is so much noise, we have to respond, there is a lot of interaction. So we are just practicing staying centered, allowing everything to move. We don't have to be involved, we don't have to be for or against anything. You could just be present, know what's going on in a relaxed way. So we know we are sitting, if we are sitting, we can feel the cushion in the chair. We know we are hearing, we recognize that hearing is happening. We have an itch and we itched our neck. We know that's happening. If there is a thought in the mind, we know that is What's going on is just thinking. And then an added layer, we could just also notice if the sitting is pleasant, if the hearing is unpleasant. Just a little subtle layer of knowing You really don't have to worry about giving it a name. It's the awareness itself is enough. We recognize our intentions. We recognize the mood. A moment at a time, sometimes, sometimes. The mind can know one or two or three things in a moment. Just are present for what is being known. You don't have to make a self-centered story about it. Just simply recognizing what is here at this moment.
If the eyes were closed, so we can open our eyes slowly. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to stretch your body. If there are any questions about taking the practice home, feel free. Should have time in the end as well. I see crystal, crystal clear. <laughs> All right, I'll pass it to Mark. Nice to be back, everyone. Happy that Shelley Graf could join Meski last week. So as uh, Meski mentioned earlier during uh, them doing the recap of what we've been learning these last number of weeks, um, we're often faced in daily life and in our meditation practice with different habits of mind that hinder that get in the way of that stability and continuity of present moment awareness, right? Actually, that's uh, surprisingly, that's one way you know somebody is maturing in their awareness practice is they realize how frequent it is to be lost in thought. Somebody who's not very well along in their practice, think, oh yeah, I'm mindful, you know, if you interviewed people on the street and you just asked them, are you aware? Are you always aware? If people answer, oh yeah, of course I'm aware. I'm mindful. I know it's like this now. You can chat, oh, probably haven't practiced. And those people who practice go, yeah, I might be aware right now, but most of the time I'm lost in thought. And what is it that, you know, what is the attitude or the understanding that keeps that keeps the mind addicted to its thoughts about this and that, right? And so as Meski mentioned, you know, this wanting mind and this aversive mind. And there are different attitudes that we can actually develop, cultivate that are much more stable and much more naturally aligned with being present. And uh, metta, the word metta means that basic friendliness, that basic goodness, that basic generosity of the heart. But we always make, like when we use words like love or kindness, loving kindness, it seems like this glorious thing. And then, you know, we kind of create this ideal. And then there's me with my habits. And, oh, I can't be loving. I'm an angry type or... You know, I've been hurt so many times. So we, we can create these ideals that then, in a way, give us permission to give up. Like, it's too late. <laughs> I'm just going to be a grumpy guy forever or something like that. But actually, <clears throat> metta, the, the spiritual, what we might mean by spiritual love, that quality of the mind or the heart that can say yes that can include 
that doesn't have to reject or throw things out of our heart. It's actually much more about what's not there than what is there. Kindness is more about what's not there. Metta, loving kindness, is really learning that there is this capacity, you know, an attitude, a way of being aware, a way of relating to experience in the present moment that is free or absent of irritation and resentment and fear and negativity and hatred. I mean, we can check right now, all of us, we're relating to the present moment in some fashion right now, right? So is that way that we're relating to the sitting body or to the sound of my voice or to your experience right now, is that way of relating for you? Is it infused with aversion and ill will? Or is it relatively at least absent of fear, irritation, ill will? Because when we learn to cultivate the attitude of metta, it's like an antidote to being a grump, to being irritable, being resentful, being hateful, being fearful. And our habit might be to think, well, that's just too far away because I am irritable, I am grumpy, I am hateful, I am resentful. I have that ongoing drama of, oh, poor me, right? Sound familiar? <laughs> right? These, so then it can seem like, oh, it'd be so far away to be loving, to be kind, to be generous, to be inclusive. But it's actually, it's important that we understand, or at least we open our mind to the possibility it's not actually far away. Because it's whatever we are, whatever attitude is here right now, right? we've been teaching you and we've been practicing, well, I can just be aware of the grumpiness or I can be aware of the resentment, right? Whatever the particular attitude might be, the mood, the attitude, the way that our mind is relating to the present moment, whatever it is that's predominant or whatever it is that we're knowing and feeling right now. If we're relating in a, with a lot of negativity, the wisdom and awareness can know, oh, I'm really irritable. I'm really angry. I'm really tight. I'm really controlling or whatever it is, right? And I care about that because this way of relating hurts. <laughs> One of my teachers, uh, Sylvia Borstein, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's written a number of wonderful books. She's quite old now at least 85, maybe even a little older, one of the founding teachers of Spirit Rock, which is a big Buddhist meditation center north of San Francisco. And uh, Sylvia sums it up with two words, oh, three words. Ill will hurts. And it's so true. You know, that's how we know we're angry, we're irritable, we're grumpy, resentful caught in some, you know, aversive frame, like, oh, poor me, is it hurts, it's tight. We feel it energetically, the sort of negativity of those, that way of relating. And then as soon as we realize that it hurts, it's actually wisdom and love that can, has enough stability, enough balance to see Oh, honey, the ill will in your mind, it hurts. And I care about that. I care enough to be aware and to be close and to not judge, but to be forgiving. Like sometimes this mind has ill will and it hurts like this and I care. See, that wasn't that far to just realize that whatever negative attitude we might be sort of stuck with right now, that we can care about that. And you see how it involves both awareness and that quality of loving kindness. 
And if we can do this for ourselves, we can do it for the people around us when we notice the person in the other car with a lot of car rage, you know, and acting out in some way. In the same way that I can notice that, oh, you're, you know, you're caught in some negative vortex, you're caught up in some negative attitude, and I care about that because ill will hurts, you're hurting, and I care, I care enough to be close, and I care enough to wish well for myself. May this heart be at ease, even when I'm grumpy. We can do it to someone else. Oh, you seem really upset too. You seem like you're hurting too. I know what that's like. It hurts. May you be at ease. And, and having that generous wish for another, you know, it can seem a little contrived, but there's nothing dysfunctional about being kind, being loving. And it doesn't tell us, like, we, we may never say that to the other person because it might not be an appropriate thing to say. But it's actually quite functional, and it doesn't keep us from taking care of ourselves. Like, because some people, when they're in a negative space, we actually want to stay away from them. It may not be safe to trust them or to do anything to help them directly. It doesn't mean we have to hate them. In the same way, if you bump into a rattlesnake, you're going to keep your distance. But we don't need to hate the rattlesnake just because it has a poisonous bite, right? We want to be careful, but we don't have to throw it out of our heart. Same thing when we're acting in a despicable way or in a way that really we don't like about ourselves. We don't have to throw ourselves out of our heart to know, yeah, this habit of my mind, it's not helpful. Do I wish it would be different? Yeah, I wish it would be different. But it is the way it is? Yeah, it is the way it is right now. Does it help to hate myself? No, it doesn't help to hate myself. What helps? What helps is to be clearly aware it's like this now, and I care. And I'm not afraid that it is this way. Doesn't mean I want it to be this way. Doesn't mean that I wouldn't wish I have a different personality. But right now, given everything in motion, this is the part of the personality that's showing up. It's like this now. And I care. And I care enough to be forgiving. And I care enough to be patient. And I care enough to wish well. May this mind, may this heart, be at ease, even when it's like this. May this, may wisdom and love protect me. Now, the reason that uh, Meski and I wanted to bring up the loving kindness practice, you know, on our last night is, it's kind of this, uh, it's really radical because our habit, and it's just a habit, it isn't the truth. The habit is whatever mood or attitude I have right now, the habit is to think that's who I am, like with a fixed. You know. But if we were simply to track our mood just on one day, just today, you'd see, oh yeah, at 8.55, my mood was like this. And then by 9.30, my mood was this. And then at 9.31, it was already different. And then sure, at 10, it was this. And so how many attitudes, how many moods, how many perspectives have we had today? Were you one mood all day long? One attitude all day long? One frame of mind all day long? No, it's very fluid. Who we are, how we're relating, the mood, it's very fluid, isn't it? So it's kind of surprising given how fluid, how often our mood and attitude changes that we haven't made an art and science of cultivating, learning how to cultivate the mood and attitudes that are really pleasant and functional and useful. And you know what just so happens to be the most functional attitude from which, through which to live a life? Kindness. That kind of, not specific kindness, oh, I'm 
going to be kind to this person, like our bumper stickers, you know, God bless America, as if we we're saying, and screw everybody else. <laughs> but when we really touch into love, spiritual love, one of the characteristics is it isn't specific to anything or anyone. When we're really in touch with that natural capacity to care, to wish well, to appreciate, it's, it's kind of like a light. You know, when we turn a light on, it doesn't say, oh, I'm just going to illuminate this area over here, but those places over there, you don't get any light, right? Because light, you know, it do, if it doesn't have a shade, it goes everywhere equally, right? And you just, you know, it's not something to believe in. Just the next time you have a natural goodness of your heart, it's active, it's alive. And it might have been caused by a particular interaction, you know, whatever it was that, that triggered or helped you to remember that this heart is good and loving, you may think, oh, it's just because this person gave me a really nice hug or this thing happened to me that made me feel good about myself. But when you actually check with awareness, okay, the heart's loving. What is the nature of this kindness, this good feeling, this generosity to the heart? What's the actual nature? And you'll see its nature is to go out everywhere. The Buddha's instructions that he gave a number of places through, he taught for about 45 years before he died in Northern India, back, you know, 2,500 years ago, a long time ago. But when he would teach about loving kindness and about how we can shift our attitude, he would use this little uh, phrase that, you know, I've memorized and it's really easy. I will abide pervading one quarter, like what's right in front of me or you, with loving kindness, right? Just like, why not? Because it's like, whatever's in front of you, I just, I happen to be in front of some of you, but, you know, <laughs> whoever, and then even beyond the walls, like, because it doesn't matter, like, why not wish well for this quarter and the second quarter and the third quarter and the fourth quarter? above and below, all around, everywhere, in every way, including to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with this heart imbued with kindness, with goodness, abundant, beautiful, boundless, meaning no place it's not going, without ill will, without hostility, no aversion, no fear, I will abide. And, you know, it, it can, like I said earlier, it can seem like, oh, that's just too much. But I really encourage you to check it out and to really notice how mindful awareness, that capacity we have to be present, how it really lines up. It's really supported by this attitude of kindness and how kindness is really supported by awareness. I like to say that it's, it's not really possible to be present without kindness. So even if you're aware that you're angry, if you're really aware, if you really have that stability of present moment awareness and you notice that you're angry or you notice that somebody else is acting out in a negative way, you'll see there's some kindness there because it's the kindness that gives it the stability, gives the present moment the stability. Like, I don't have to throw you out of my heart. I don't have to construct some separation. I can include the simple truth that it's like this now. My attitude, my mind, my body, it's like this now. Your mind, your attitude, my experience of you, it's like this now. You see how that has the flavor, that inclusive flavor of love. That's like a good technical definition of love. It's that attitude of mind that it can include the way it is. Because love's not afraid. 
you know, like if you had a good parent or a grandparent when you were a kid or even now as an adult, and you'd go to them, and let's say you've been bad, you know, you made some bad mistakes or something, somebody who really loves you, they're not going to be afraid of whatever unskillful thing you did. They're going to hold you. They're going to tell you, we'll, we'll fix this. We'll figure something out. I love you because their love isn't dependent on you being a perfect human being. Their love is inclusive of you being an ordinary human being, which means <laughs> imperfect because that's sort of goes with the territory of being a human being. So we're going to do a little practice now where we get to, and you can weave this into like the first five or 10 minutes of your meditation practice. And it's really just a way of um, remembering and keeping this attitude of loving kindness in mind. So in a way, it's a mindfulness practice, but we're having an exclusive object. We're not noticing what's predominant in the moment. We're instead keeping in mind this heart, this mind's capacity, potential to be loving. And, we're, and it, initially it might be faint. There might be a lot of grumpiness in our attitude or whatever, right? But can we find, however faint, however subtle it might be, can we find the seed, the potentiality of kindness and love and friendliness that's here and now, not contrived? And then if we keep it in mind, you'll notice it becomes a stronger and stronger aspect or attitude of the mind. That's how we grow strength and loving kindness is we keep it in mind. That's what we'll do now. So. Adjust your body if you need to. We'll settle in for maybe a 15 minute or so sitting practice. You might wanna just take a longer, easy, deep breath in and out a few times just to help settle in. And you can even notice this easy, deep breathing as a simple act of kindness. A little bit of self-soothing, taking care of ourselves in this simple way. Filling and emptying the lungs maybe one or two more times. And eventually allow your breathing just to continue on its own. You don't need to make it any particular way. And we'll do the loving kindness practice, metta. And traditionally, you would begin with yourself, sending love, wishing well to yourself. But if for whatever reason that feels too challenging to you, for you, you can just bring to mind somebody who's really been there for you in your life, like a benefactor, could even be a pet, doesn't have to be a person, but if you can, begin with yourself, and you can repeat some of the phrases that I'm going to say out loud, you can just say them silently in your own heart, you just can connect with the sincerity of that simple wish. So I care about this life. How do I know? Because right now I'm willing to be close. I'm willing to feel what's here to feel. And I'm willing to wish well for myself. So here are the phrases you can repeat after me silently. May the deepest wisdom and love protect me always.
And may this heart, the sensitive heart, be happy and peaceful. And may my body be healthy and strong. And may I take care of my life with ease through all the changing conditions. May I take care of this life with ease. And beginning again, may the deepest wisdom and love protect me always. And may this sensitive heart here be happy and peaceful. And may this body be healthy and strong. And may I take care of this life with real ease through all the changing conditions. I do care of this life. I care enough to be close and to wish well for myself. So again, May the deepest wisdom and love protect me always. And may this sensitive heart be happy and peaceful. May this body be healthy and strong. And may I care for this life with real ease through all the change. So try it a few times on your own. Pause after each phrase and just feel the goodness of that simple wish. Just do the best you can. And of course, you can change the words, make it feel more real for yourself. Talking directly to your own life. Just keep using the phrases, but when the feeling of loving kindness is clear and strong, then that can be your meditation object. Just feel that generous opening, loving opening of your heart, like a warm light that's shining and filling the space of your life right now. And if you haven't, just see if you can keep the metta, the loving kindness in mind without the phrases. Just feel that love for yourself, for your life. And realizing that your dear ones, the people you easily love in your life, dear friends, partners, children, a pet, 
Just see who comes to mind. And just let the love spill over and include them too. May you also be safe and protected. And may the deepest wisdom and love protect you too. And may your heart be happy and peaceful. And may you have good health and strength. And may you also live your life with ease through all the twists and turns of your life. May you be at ease. Just like that. Send in your love, your good wishes. Use the phrases until the love feels really clear. And then you can drop the phrases and just feel the generosity going out to your dear ones, to your friends, and even beyond to all beings. So just do the best you can. We'll continue in silence for a while. So with this meditation, we're learning how to keep the attitude of loving kindness in mind. And the phrases, the individuals you bring to mind are just helpful in connecting with the attitude of loving kindness. And when the attitude is really clear, we can drop the images of the people we brought to mind and the phrases and learn how to abide in this generosity of kindness as if a warm, generous, embracing, wholesome goodness of the heart is just radiating out in all directions, above and below, everywhere and every way. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with love, abundant, exalted, boundless, free from ill will, free from all hostility. I will abide.
And again, for just another few minutes, see if you can learn how it might be possible to keep this attitude of kindness, this uncontrived natural capacity of our heart to be kind and loving, just to keep it in mind toward oneself, toward others, toward all beings. As the Buddha says, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with kindness, abundant, exalted, boundless, free from ill will, free from hostility, I will abide. And if you need to adjust your body, stretch your limbs, whatever helps you. And I'll just mention while you're stretching that uh, if you want some support for this, um, the handout for week five, because uh, remember the handouts that we've been linking to in the emails that we've been sending to everyone, there are six handouts or six because we usually teach the intro class in six weeks, um, but uh, this one ended up being four weeks. So anyway, week five handout is about the loving kindness practice. So it will be a good resource for you. And then also um, Common Ground has so many talks and guided meditations that have been recorded, including many guided meditations on loving kindness. And they're stored on a wonderful website called dharmacy.org. You can access it from our website, one of the main menu items, and you could just search. You could search for Meta, M-E-T-T-A, or put in loving kindness, and you'll get talks and guided meditations. Uh, and same thing with, you know, the awareness and mindfulness practices too. And like they talked, uh, Shelley and Meski talked about the hindrances. It's just a really good resource, that website, dharmacy.org. So I think we're gonna open it up for some questions and discussion and Meski and I will just take turns responding to whatever you wanna bring up. Remember, it doesn't have to be a formed question. It might be just sharing some of what you've been learning in your sitting practice at home or your daily life practice at home or something that happened during the meditation tonight. And uh, Meski or I might have some reflections on, yeah, that how we understand what your experience, um, yeah, just how it fits into the, the general scheme of us learning. It's like, I think we mentioned that first week. Normally our attention is focused on the external world, world but as uh, someone interested in awareness, we start turning the awareness within. It's like, oh, there's a mind here. Maybe I should pay attention, not just to what's going on around me, but How's the heart doing? What's the mind doing? What's the mind knowing? Because right? we, the awareness has the capacity to be interested in the internal processes of the mind and heart itself. It's kind of amazing. It's like, you know, exp the old days when explorers would go explore new things or go into outer space. It's like a new space to go check out like, oh my God, there's a mind here. And it's like this now. So anyway, what have you been learning? What questions are emerging? People online, you can just either raise your digital hand or if you don't know how to do that, just feel free to unmute yourself, start to talk and Meski and I will respond.
And maybe if you're good luck, you get the mic from Matthew. So this is one for the Zoom. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, this is just from going from the six weeks to the four weeks, what are the areas that outside of loving kindness that we should be digging into to kind of get the full intro to mindfulness experience? Well, you need 20 years, <laughs> not six weeks. But the, the thing is, previous courses are up there. So we recorded, we didn't record last week, but we're recording tonight for the first two months. There are several six week classes just sitting there on our YouTube channel. So you can listen to them. And uh, the key, and Besky and I probably want to talk about this anyway, but uh, you're going to need to keep being a learner, all of us. If I've been, I've just had my 40 year anniversary. You know, I started when I was 24, and uh, I'm 64. Sincere practitioner for 40 years, and I just I consider myself a mature beginner, you know, because there's a lot to learn. So don't get too tight about well, this is a four week introduction, not a six week. And there are a number of programs you can just slide right into. And the programs at the center are all online and in person now. So you can just take a look at our public calendar. Shelley has their main program Wednesday nights. Um, I have mine usually Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. And that's just ongoing instruction. And over a number of years, we kind of cover everything there is to cover, but not in six weeks. It's just the, the nature of the mind and how we fall into patterns of suffering. It's, it's pretty, you know, there's, there's a lot there. But basically it's, as Mesky mentioned, you know, with, with the wanting and the not wanting, it's just different recuperations of how we reject and how we throw the moment out of our heart and learning this new habit of saying, yes, it's like this now. I can actually be close. I can actually be intimate. I can see more clearly. And that allows for a more skillful response. I, uh, so I was here the first week and I did miss last week, but, um, I guess what I'm wondering is what you see as the fruits of the practice. I sort of feel like I've got beginnings of understanding of what the process might look like. And I know a little bit about why I came to this, but I'm, Guess I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the practice. Of practice. Mm. Yeah, it's really a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many years ago that I took this first class, Intro to Meditation. I don't like to talk about stories, but I uh, have so many questions. I drove Mark crazy. It's like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? Like, what you going to do with that? Like, I noticed this and then what's going to happen? Like, I need to fix my life right now. That's where I was. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you can't fix it right away, you know. Anyway, I am uh, have lots of attitudes in my mind. I would never go anywhere if I don't want to. Any one winter, maybe after a year, I found myself like my car broke down and then I was waiting for a bus to come to Common Ground. I was like, what the hell? I mean, I don't even want to go to work if my car broke down. I would just call in and be like, I ain't going nowhere. 
Um, it's really interesting just to what has happened to me to so personally speaking even though I had like great parents and everything the whole nine yards um, um there was a realization like stuff that they that don't teach you in school on how to relate to life like really felt I messed it, where do they teach you this I mean I guess people would go to therapy and pay for it and so on but I just want somebody like a real download of like what what the hell this is like what the hell is this and then every single time that I am like oh I got it I got it and then you know you think you are enlightened he say go talk to your parents or spend time with them <laughs> um like i would just have to call comcast to me like and then i would just be pissed and cursing somebody so i am like Ooh, apparently not um so in a way, how life goes, nothing has changed, but my responses to that, and even to my own unskillfulness, is slowly loosening up a bit. Like, I don't take things too seriously. Um, I think there were like a period of time, like I'm so, I wanted to get somewhere with meditation. Like I need to be peaceful. Like I've been practicing for five years. What's happening? So the fruit of the practice now for me is like, if I have a bad sit or a, a life circumstances, it is okay. And I don't, I don't even, I don't want to say I don't want it to be nice, but I'm just not that diluted to like, it's going to be always nice. Like, I, I don't run from what's happening. I still am attached a lot, but I hate to say I, I, but there is a little, it's going to be okay. Underneath all the noise, there is like, it's what it is, it's gonna be okay. And what's gonna happen is gonna happen. Whatever is happening is always lawful, like. And yeah, and, and you know, just that the winter situation, I, it's a way of life now, it's never ending, it's just, I, I honestly would tell you if there was anything better, I will go like, I will go right now, but there isn't anything better that I have found so far. So, you know, what do you do? He is in this predicament, like, what can we do? That's true. That's me. But you should hear from somebody that practiced for 40 years. Yeah, no, I thought it was a great answer. And I would probably say something very similar to what I just heard Mesky say. Um, but for people who are interested, someone asked the Buddha that question. It's great. I mean, it's amazing they kind of recorded these teachings. I mean, for a long time, it was just an oral tradition. And about 500 years after the Buddha had died, they actually wrote things down. But there's a great discourse where the the fruits of the holy life, it's, it's something like that is the title. But... If I don't remember to send it to you, Steve, send me an email, I'll, I'll send it to you. You might enjoy reading it, The Fruits of the Holy Life. And basically someone asked exactly that question to the Buddha, like, you know, so what do you get when, from your, your practice? What are the fruits of your practice? It's a, a totally appropriate question to ask if someone's gonna dig in. But I see Abby has their hand up. Abby, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll, um, Amplify your uh, sound here so everyone in the room can hear you. Go ahead. Um, 
I was really struck by the something you said at the beginning, Musky, of the the doubt masquerading as wisdom. And I find that that's very true for my experience. Um, I tend to think that I already know what is going to happen before life happens. And sometimes life proves me right or wrong. Um, but sometimes that can lead to a fixed mindset and lack of curiosity and you know, depression, anxiety, all sorts of things. So what have you found? Because obviously I'm, I'm coming back week after week and finding this very helpful. Um, what have you found to be useful, both of you, when you're not necessarily aware that your doubt is masquerading as wisdom when you're not when you think it's wisdom but it is in fact doubt um to kind of speak to yourself to kind of hold yourself in truth yeah i'll go first and then i'll pass uh mike over to maski Yeah, it's interesting uh, because we might think because doubt can masquerade as wisdom and and then on the other hand, doubt can um, yeah be so debilitating because it keeps us from action. So I got to figure things out. Should I be with this person or not? Should I go to common ground or not? You know, should I stick with this job or not? Should I be with my breath or should I use hearing as my anchor? It's like, should I have cornflakes for breakfast or a raisin bran? And, and the thing is, is there actually an answer to any of those questions? Oh, I mean, we can pretend there's an answer. And that's called self-importance. You know, this, because we're afraid, one of the things that our heart is really afraid of is the ambiguity and the uncertainty. So it's interesting, like uh, the, the habit often is that I've got to figure things out in order to be living a good life, in order to be safe, in order to be doing the right thing. But the more, the most subtle, the deepest teaching of the Buddha is this teaching about the impersonal nature. And the simple way to understand what the Buddha is pointing to is that whatever we're experiencing now, including our own thoughts about ourselves, thoughts about others, the activity of this moment, it's all nature, it's all a natural process. And so me being reflective and me wanting to do it right and me being worried that I won't do it right do I have it right? Am I even saying the right thing to these people right now? Right? I could get consumed by doubt. But I can also remember that whatever's going on, it's a natural process. It's nature. Mark right now, what we call Mark, the guy up front teaching with Meski, this is a natural process that's unfolding. And Part of that natural process can be aware. This is a natural process. It really lightens the load. You know, some of you probably are parents. I'm not, I didn't raise a kid. And uh, can you imagine like, as a parent thinking you have to do it right? As if there's a right way, like when do you let your kid have a phone? Or how much TV does a kid get to watch? And what kind of TV? Do they get sugar or no sugar? You know, it's endless. And we just get tighter and tighter and tighter. Or we draw the line in the sand and we say, no sugar for the kid, <laughs> just for the adults. And then we have doubt, like, oh, maybe I'm being too hard. Or somebody challenges us. As soon as we kind of have a fixed view about something, all of a sudden we have to defend that fixed view because there are other views out there, people with a different perspective. So one way to kind of address this question that Abby's raising is like, just imagine living our life from an unfixed 
place. Doesn't mean we can't have a discussion about politics with a friend and have an opinion. It just means we state that opinion without being fixed about it. Right now, in this moment, this is how I'm seeing things. Ask me in five seconds, it may be different, but right now that I see it this way. How do you see it? Oh, that's interesting. Because then it's like, it's a living, breathing, every view, every perspective is understood to be something that's living, breathing, evolving. And we have a lot of that, well, who really knows? Still, I have to make choices, but maybe it's okay to make choices knowing that we don't know with certainty because it's so much better than pretending we're certain. That's what's so intolerable is pretending we're certain when we're not. So I'll pass it to Mesky for reflections. Well, one of the trickiest things is that like, when the mind is really trying to investigate something, like even how to discern wisdom in doubt. Oh, maybe it's like this. Oh, okay, let's go this way. And just simply even tuning to the energy in the body. Um, you can after like whatever, 25 minutes or 45 minutes of spinning and spinning and spinning and it just keeping the same toe this way or that way. Basically, when we are doubting, we are not really looking for an answer. It's, it seems like it. We are not even looking for a resolution. Mm, I'm not sure it's this way. We just really don't want to make up our mind. We don't want to make mistakes. Like there is so much fear in identification like what if you know i've been meditating for this long what if this thing this whole path is like not right again like i say it i'm like well it, you know just i'm also for the most part i'm humbled by people that just continue to do things wholeheartedly you know, without expecting anything. That is just so inspiring. So that kind of helps me get out of my head, like from the spinning, you know, it, a lot of it is self-importance. And in you are, I'm, you know, for the, in my practice, I'm surprised every single moment, how much I don't know, like so much I don't know. So you know, after a while, like, I don't even have to pretend. But half the time, we don't know that doubt is what's working in the mind. We are, like, really so into it. Oh, wow, this is very interesting. You know, and then after that, oh, that was doubt. Because sometimes it's not at the time that that we would know to discern it but even after the fact it really shows up very differently in the body than wisdom it shows up in the mind it just really tires the body mind when we are like, even doubting somebody like i'm not sure if you know they are honest i'm not you know there is like always tightness when we are loving and open it's very different energy just paying attention to the energy to the body and just seeing and knowing that we don't know, and that one is real. Well, <laughs> you have to finish up. Yeah, to finish up. So, for those of you on, online, I I pasted the the link for um. The website in case you want to support the center and support the teachers and but what's really important if you're new to common ground what we really want you to take away is this practice we've been doing for 30 years now center started in 1993 
we don't charge for any of the programs and we really don't talk about money and we don't do fundraising because for these 30 years, we've had this practice of dana, the circle of giving and receiving. It's a Pali word. Usually it's translated as generosity, but it's this deeper spiritual teaching. So first we just want people to just receive whatever you get from these teachings and the center and our retreat center in Wisconsin that we've been developing and online programming, just to receive it as a free gift. Of course, it happens because people have supported it in the past. So it's part of that circle. But the first lesson we need to learn is like how to receive a free gift, no strings attached. We have to let it land like, well, that's really nice. And then when you naturally feel like wanting to support the center, support the livelihood of the teachers, then let that be expressed also in a natural way that makes sense in your life. If you're somebody who really doesn't have enough money just to take care of your needs, then giving money isn't going to be the thing you do. Maybe you just send out your good wishes of gratitude and appreciation, or maybe you volunteer or who knows what you do, but you find some way to keep that circle of giving and receiving. Some of you might have a lot of resources and money, then it would be natural to send some, uh, you know, leave a donation in the bowl. If you're here, you can use the iPad or use the link for those online. You can always go to the website and contribute. And if you have any questions about some more of the specifics, just reach out to the center. And our treasurer, he um, publishes a letter on the website. You can get a little bit more specifics about how our center is doing. But we we operate in a frugal way and we seem to be doing okay with this circle of giving and receiving. So uh, that, that goes for two, just finding other ways to be part of the community. Because as Me Meski mentioned at the beginning of the class tonight, you know, we're going against the stream. Culture, our culture is really about distraction, you know, and don't turn inward because <laughs> you're not going to like what you find. So stay busy and stay distracted and hope you make it to the end or something like, I mean, it's silly when you say it out loud. So if we're really gonna live a more reflective life, you're gonna need at least one good friend who's into living a reflective life, a mindful life. So find a friend at a place like this. And there are other good Buddhist meditation centers in town if you're in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And generally around the country, if some of you online or outside of uh, our area, you know, look, and this particular kind of Buddhism, you would look for insight meditation or Vipassana meditation, but you might just have to, you know, find what you find in your local area and get be part of it and uh, create a wholesome group of folks that are interested in looking inward and cultivating mindful awareness. Do you want to do the closing blessing? Sure. So in the last four weeks, we've been exploring and spending much effort and energy to reflect within, to wholeheartedly look at this life and so during our effort, if all of this learning, exploration, dedication the fruits of this exploration from the weeks, may it not only benefit the people in this room, but all of you know, our parents, ancestors, families, and actually all beings everywhere. May they benefit from our fruits of practice. We wish this not just to be a benefit to this heart, but all beings everywhere without exception. Thank you all for your practice. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you for showing up.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And just an announcement that in October, there will be another um, intro to meditation for just BIPOC, uh, myself, and then two other teachers, Jan Racho and Stacy McLondon will be doing a BIPOC intro class. So spread the word out or if you are by pack you can come back and we will spend four more weeks thanks everybody and you're always going to do more in the class so if you're not right the bipoc class the winter there will be one spring there will be one and summer there will be one so and some people just keep taking it every you know steve's been around for probably seven eight ten years now for a while so doesn't mean he hasn't learned anything. <laughs> and that's why we teach it over and over again. Because it's good for us too. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.